Well, good morning, friends. Russ Barkley here with your weekly Saturday research update on what's new in ADHD in the research journals. Again, you can find all of the research I was able to locate over in the thumbnail sketch, along with the links to the articles that I'll be discussing today. So thanks for joining me. Hey, I got another dad joke for you. As always, where would you be without my dad jokes? Okay. Why does a pharmacist walk on her tiptoes so she doesn't wake the sleeping pills? Oh, she's so considerate. You just, it's so bad. I, I'm sorry. My apologies, everybody. In any case, let's get started. Uh, first article up, uh, just a few brief comments here, is a meta-analysis, woohoo, of research on the time perception deficits in ADHD. As you know, uh, back in the early 1990s, I was the first to talk about ADHD being a disorder of executive functioning and then predicting that this would impair the ability to perceive and use time. We subsequently went on and did a nice study showing that there were massive problems with the sensing uh, and use of time for time management in kids and then later in adults with ADHD. And a lot of research has gone on since those initial studies that has sort of affirmed this relationship. And we can attest to that now because here's a meta-analysis of all of those studies. Uh, and it, of course, does a review of the literature, finds all of the studies that it can. And in this case, they found studies that involve more than 824 different measures of time perception uh, in a variety of age groups. They broke it down into those above and below age 18. And what they found, of course, was that both groups had significant problems with their sense and use of time. They calculated an effect size of about 0.69. What does that mean? It means that the difference between the ADHD groups and the control groups were at least that portion of a standard deviation difference. That's a huge difference. Usually we look for effect sizes that are much lower than that in psychological research. This suggests that the differences between the groups are rather substantial, nearly, well, more than two-thirds of a standard deviation difference between typicals and ADHD individuals. They did find that in the samples uh, below age 18, uh, there was a significant link between sense of time and working memory measures. Makes sense. I argued that working memory was one of the components of executive functioning that we use for time perception. We hold time in mind and use it to guide our behavior. And uh, they, of course, found that to be the case. We also found that uh, inhibition or impulse control was significantly related to that as well. Uh, another component of executive functioning uh, and also implicated in working memory as well. They did find, however, that in samples that were older than 18 years of age, it was primarily just a deficit in sense of time. They didn't see as much of an effect on working memory in the older samples. So uh, a really nice review of the literature here, just reaffirming uh, what I said in my video here on ADHD and time blindness. There is a major problem with timing, time perception, and especially using time to manage one's own behavior in people with ADHD. And it seems to be there across the lifespan. Okay, next study to tee up. This was a study that was published uh, just this past week. And it was in the International Journal of Impotence Research. Uh, this is an important study, I think, because it uses a very large sample, over 17,000 men in this study, and it compared those with ADHD who were on medication for at least three years or more with those who were not taking long-term medication uh, but had ADHD and with a typical control group also who were not taking medication. And it's looking at the effects of medication on testosterone functioning. And what it found is that there was a small but significant adverse effect of long-term use of medication on testicular 
hypofunction, under-functioning of the testicles, and was found in these men after who had an average of about five years of ADHD medication. Now, that's, of course, an adverse effect, but let's not get too excited here because out of the 17,200 plus men, they found just 1.2%, say it again, 1.2% were found to have this form of testicular hypofunctioning from long-term medication use. So is there a relationship? Seems to be. Is it a clinically significant one? I don't think so. You're looking at about one out of 100 adults with ADHD men who take medication for that time or longer are having difficulties with testicular functioning versus, by the way, about 0.67% uh, of individuals who didn't take medication, either if they had ADHD or they weren't ADHD. So there's a slight rise by about two-thirds of 1% in the risk of having a problem with testicular functioning if you take long-term medication use. So let's juxtapose that risk with what happens to people if they don't take their medication. And on this channel, as you know, I have documented the myriad adverse outcomes linked to child, and in this case, adult ADHD, from occupational problems to risk of early death due to uh, risk-taking, accidental injuries. We've also talked about the shortened life expectancy. We've talked about the other risks of drug use, criminal behavior, health problems, and so on, linked to untreated ADHD. So I think that the small but significant risk documented here, while statistically significant because of the huge sample they used, is not all that clinically significant when it comes to weighing the risks and benefits of medication use for treating adult ADHD. But I did want to draw that review to your attention because it was in the research uh, this week and it hasn't been studied very well in men with ADHD, okay? So my feeling is take it with a grain of salt, so to speak, but there is this slight risk out there. All right, the next study up is on the relationship of mother's consumption of fiber intake during pregnancy and the children's development of ADHD across childhood. This is a Norwegian study. It involves very large samples uh, of mothers. It was published just recently in Biological Psychiatry. And as you can see down here, they studied more than 21,000 mother, father, and child trios in this sample, they looked at maternal consumption of fiber intake during pregnancy. They then looked at offspring ADHD uh, at three different ages, ages three, five, and eight years of age. Uh, it's a very good study. What I really liked about this study is that they also controlled for genetic risks for ADHD in their analyses. That's very important because it's possible that mothers with ADHD consume a very different diet than mothers without ADHD during their pregnancy, and therefore any differences in dietary intake could simply be a reflection of the fact that the mom has ADHD too, so does her child, there's a genetic transmission of risk and diet has nothing to do with it. So we need to have these genetically informed studies, as I call them, in which efforts are made to try to control for the genetic risks from mother to child when examining other factors that might be related. So what did the study find? It did find that the extent to which mothers did or did not consume fiber in their diet and the degree of fiber consumption was directly related to the risk of ADHD at the three time points measured in this study across childhood. So higher fiber content was associated with lower risks for ADHD symptoms, lower severity of ADHD symptoms. So they of course conclude that maternal fiber intake is related to child ADHD risk 
even controlling for the striking genetic risk that we know exists. So uh, a nice little suggestion there uh, with regard to fiber intake during pregnancy in women uh, and risk for ADHD. Again, although the risk was there, by the way, I just want to emphasize in the results that the associations, though they were significant because of, again, a very large sample size, the degree of the relationships here that were found were very low. So correlations of about negative 0.14. As we all know, correlations range from 0 to 1.00. So a correlation of about 0.14 is very small. What does that mean? It means that fiber intake uh, was associated with about 3% or less of the variation in symptoms in the children, okay? That's important. To find that out, what do we do? We square the correlation, and it tells us how, what, what percentage of the variation in the measure is related to, in this case, fiber intake. So while there is a link, it's statistically significant. In a large population, it is not necessarily all that clinically interesting. Let's not all rush out and overdose on fiber during pregnancy if you're a woman. But it's something to consider. That's all we're seeing here. There is some small significant relationship between fiber intake during pregnancy and risk for ADHD symptoms. Okay, let's look at the next study because we got six that we're looking at today. Number four is this study of the relationship of maternal postpartum depression to early childhood aggression and later ADHD in the children of those pregnancies. This was published over in the International Journal of Behavioral Development. Uh, and again, this is a very good size study of, of its kind. It's looking at caregivers and about nearly 200 children, about 182 children were involved uh, in this study with their moms. And the study does find that maternal postpartum depression was linked both to aggressive behavior and hyperactivity at age three and later risk of ADHD symptoms and degree of ADHD symptoms during the follow-up period at sixth grade. So this would suggest that maternal postpartum depression is a risk factor for children with ADHD or children having ADHD. Doesn't mean that the depression is causing that. It's just a correlate, a risk factor. Now, why would that be there? Because it's very possible, based on earlier research, that mothers with ADHD, after pregnancy, when they deliver, do have a higher risk of maternal depression. So it's not clear from this that it's the maternal depression that is the risk factor, or whether it's just a marker that the mother probably had ADHD as well. They didn't measure that in these women. So we can't tell a correlation here from a cause. It could simply mean, as I've said, that the risk of depression is simply a marker that the mother had ADHD. And of course, if moms have ADHD, there is a high likelihood that their children are going to have ADHD as well. Uh, what's the risk? Eight times higher than the population risk for ADHD, because as you know, ADHD is a very genetically predisposed disorder. So a good study suggesting that moms who have significant postpartum depression need to be followed and not only treated for their depression if necessary, but also their children need to be followed for a higher risk of ADHD symptoms later in life. So uh, a nice study there, but again, we gotta be very careful with how we interpret that study. All right, let's go on to study number five. Uh, here again, oh my God, another meta-analysis. This is a very important one, by the way, folks, because it's a systematic review of the degree to which exposure to certain chemicals in the environment is linked to risk for ADHD in children. They examine a number of different kinds of chemicals and exposures in the environment, uh, and they looked at chemical exposure at least six months prior to the measurement of ADHD, as well as the a diagnosis of ADHD and symptoms. 
They included papers that were found between 1975 and 2019, so a big sampling of studies here, and they looked at exposure to anesthetics, exposure to organophosphates, cadmium, hexochlorobenzene, lead, mercury, and polychlorinated biphenyls, which, as you know, are related to plastics uh, in the environment. So let's have a look here. What did they find? Number one, the biggest link was found between exposure to lead and risk of ADHD in the in individuals. No surprise there. We have seen repeatedly, going back to the 1970s, that exposure to high levels of lead in children was linked to an increased risk of ADHD in those children. It's believed that's because lead is a very significant toxin to the brain, especially the development of the executive or prefrontal network. So they found that that was the greatest risk. They found odds ratios of 1.6 to 2.6. What does that mean? That means that kids with significant lead levels were 60 to 200% more likely to have ADHD if they were exposed to lead than kids who were not, that is, kids who had significant lead levels. So that's what an odds ratio means. An odds ratio of one means that the risk is even. Anything above one indicates an elevated risk. So uh, that's about 60 to, excuse me, 160% uh, was the risk factor there. So very high. They did find significant but very small relationships between several other chemicals in the environment uh, and risk of ADHD. And one of these was for the organophosphates, uh, very small correlation there, uh, about 0.11. Remember, square the correlation, you get the percentage of influence there. That suggests that we're looking at less than a 2% variation in symptoms due to that exposure. Uh, other exposures had to do with the polychlorinated biphenyls, very small correlation there, 0.08, explaining less than 1% of symptom variation. Uh, and then we're looking at uh, both prenatal and childhood exposure to mercury, also related to ADHD, but correlation of about 0.02, very low. So I, I wanna emphasize the big news here was the relationship to lead exposure. The exposure to the other compounds that I mentioned creates a very, very small change in ADHD symptom risk in individuals, or, or, uh, individuals with <coughs> exposure compared to individuals without exposure. So, a uh, very good paper published over there in Prevention Science. Have a look at the thumbnail sketch for the link to that meta-analysis. Last up, I thought you might want to know this, is a small but I think very important study uh, out of Brazil looking at the effectiveness of transcranial direct current stimulation over the left prefrontal cortex in children and adolescents. What's significant about this is not just that it's international, though I do like to showcase international studies, of course, but also that it involved randomization to the active treatment versus a sham placebo treatment, triple-blinded, so the patient and people doing the evaluation, parents, clinicians, did not know who got the real transcranial stimulation, who got the sham stimulation, uh, and a nice crossover trial study design as well. So all the right things to conduct a very rigorous test of this treatment for ADHD. And what were the results? No effect. Notice that when you do a really good, well-controlled study, there was no effect here. Whereas earlier studies that did not involve this degree of rigor were sometimes reporting positive benefits. By the way, in case you want to know, they were doing direct current stimulation for about 30 minutes a day for five days, so five daily sessions. They didn't find anything. So uh, this adds to the growing skepticism about this kind of treatment 
in ADHD. This is published over in Frontiers in Psychiatry, by the way. Okay, well, that's enough. I've gone on long enough here. We had a chance to talk about six important studies this week. Thanks for joining me. Uh, it's coming up on the New Year this weekend, so Happy New Year, everybody. I'll see you in the New Year on this channel. Thanks for subscribing and for recommending this channel to others. Really appreciate your support. Take care, everybody, and be well.